Today I am talking with Vinay in an extremely insightful conversation about the significance of Ramayana in today's time. Now we are all familiar with the Ramayana, but in this conversation we'll be focusing on three specific themes: faith, human emotions and mental health. Vinay is a wonderful storyteller and he outlines each theme with multiple examples. He unravels them beautifully and we try to understand the significance of each of them when applied in today's context. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi Vinay, welcome to the podcast. Hi Deepak, thank you for having me. So lovely of you to take the time and again you are one of the more varied guests which have come on the podcast. <laughs> so before we start Vinay, a quick mm-hmm. introduction to your background, to your journey and to who you are and who you have been till this point. Sure. So um to make it as brief as possible, um I'm a storyteller by passion and architect by training uh my fascination for indic lore um for the power of stories for myth- mythology in general began for as long as i can remember it's been around i don't know when it began um but it it took more serious turns some years ago when i realized that stories are connected to a host of other ideas they're connected to to yoga they're connected to philosophy they're connected to symbolism to mantras to so much more um to mental well being so that's when i started exploring this a little bit more i started to um for for myself get a clearer understanding and although the journey is still ongoing at some point um, i felt called out to to share a little bit and um that's when i started giving more talks uh started exploring different different areas of um puranic wisdom of the intersection of sometimes uh, puranas and history is kind of different topics this was what i was doing individually i also then dabbled a little bit into the collaborative space where i said storytelling is such an emo- emotive space and so is music classical music um is like that for me so i said can we can we look at a space of combining these two together can uh, music and storytelling create a seamless experience for a listener to be able to go with it so the way i see it the focus of what i do is to give people the space to discover and and find meaning in their own spiritual journeys and um that's what i'm currently exploring through different themes of course but yeah and did this fascination with storytelling as well as an interest in indic lore were they always coinciding coinciding or did one come before the other i think for me as long as i can remember it's been in decor it's um i was okay. just obsessed with with gods from a very young age i would i would just read amachandra kadas over and over again so i think story telling kind of got imbibed into that uh, it was not a stand alone thing through through in decor i i think my fascination for storytelling began that would be a fair way to put it interesting so coming to the theme of of our discussion today is the mm-hmm. significance and relevance of ramayana in in today's time yes um but before we get to that part could you just lay out the landscape of of how many versions of ramayana are there and what what is there to be understood in that scope so i think um that's a very very interesting question as to how many versions are there again this uh, question itself leads one to think how many written versions versus how many oral versions um hmm. there are so many different languages in which ramayana has been adapted in so many different ways for example um if we look at telugu it's not that there is one telugu ramayana that is a, a translation of the valmiki ramayana ramayana there are several tra- um, translations that exist within the language itself so for me it might be difficult to put a number onto how many versions are there but i think what is fascinating is um that for every language where there is a ramayana there is often a significant uh, interpretation or a significant addition if i can call it that which is different from the valmiki ramayana and i think that's what makes these um regional retellings of the ramayana so fascinating because there is there is some element that gets added in which is very important to the person who is communicating that so um uh, and this is i think this is when things get blended up in a larger sense and we tend to look at ramayana as a whole but the variation suggests mm-hmm. some very interesting uh, differences different ways of looking at things uh, i'll give you some examples as we go ahead but um, to answer the question of how many ramayanas there are i don't know because i think ramayana is a still being written in different languages so that is fascinating but just to pick up a one small thread which you mentioned that all the variations do suggest something mm-hmm. and you said we will take it forward again but yeah. what is the 
what is it that they are suggesting? Okay, so um, let's take this beautiful moment in the Ramayana where um, Hanuman is about to meet Sita for the first time. This happens in the Sundar Kanda where he is he has gone to look for Sita, and he has identified now that she is indeed Sita. Now. Valmiki says over there that Hanuman thinks about how is it that I need to communicate with her because if I speak in Sanskrit, she will get suspicious that I am Ravana and she will not trust me. And if she doesn't trust me, then my entire mission will fail. So therefore, I should not speak in Sanskrit. So what Hanuman decides to do is that he says, I will just speak in a local dialect that people around Ayodhya can were, were able to converse in because she will recognize this and no one, none of the Rakshasis who are around her because Sita is in the middle of uh, Ashokavanam where she's being guarded by the Rakshasis. So Hanuman's concern is that nobody else should catch that conversation. But Sita at the same time should be reassured. Valmiki gives this as a hint and he says Hanuman speaks to her in that dialect but he uses Sanskrit to communicate that. Whereas if you look at the Ramcharitramanas, the entire conversation happens in that dialect itself. So this is itself indicating that at this at the time when Valmiki wrote the Ramayana as well, we can well infer how many different languages were already in conversation or already um, being spoken at that time. So moments like these make one think about how ours has always been a um, a very multilingual society, and that there have been different dialects, different ways of understanding things, and all of them find place in their. Um, in the Adikavya, which is the Valmiki Ramayana, but they, they emerge with their complete glory in um, other retellings. So I'll, I'll take another example to, to also make it clearer. In the Valmiki Ramayana, when um, Rama receives the news that he must go to the forest for 14 years, he comes and tells Sita. Immediately she says, I will come with him. Now this is a, this is a standard conversation that we see in most of the Ramayanas that come after as well. But in the Valmiki Ramayana, when she tells him that I will say, I will come along with you, he says, no, you stay back here. You take care of um, the entire kingdom, my parents, all of them, they will depend on you. But she insists and she says, no, uh, I will come. So this, this tussle goes on for a while. And at some point, she takes a very stern tone with him and she says, all right, so you seem very insistent on not taking me. Then let me do one thing. Let me inform my father, Janaka, that he got me married to a woman. So... Because you clearly are not courageous enough. You are worried that you can't take care of me. So you are doubting your own masculinity over here is what she says to me. Now Sita in the Ramcharitramanas is very different. Sita in the Ramcharitramanas appeals to him. She beseeches him saying, Rama, please, without you, I'm absolutely nothing. What meaning is there for my life? So you can see that this is also possibly an indication of the status given. So it could be a social reflection also as to how 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 was a woman being perceived in the time of the Ramchandramanas' uh, emergence, you know, where her role is more submissive, where her role is that of a more gentle partner, as opposed to the Valmiki Ramayana, where she says, why are you scared? Is that what it is? So different aspects also kind of hint as to what are some of the other conditions that are, are happening, which influence the writing in itself. So, yeah. Yeah, no, these are fascinating examples, especially the first one which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, it shows that obviously there were different dialects present, but there is yeah. also this cognizance that different people might not understand different yes, dialects. So it's exactly. almost like a meta reflection yeah. there. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. And and to, to acknowledge and try to make something of it, that is fascinating. He, he could have mm -hmm. just, you know, slided past that entire segment and just said Hanuman spoke to her in a language that was only known to both of them. But instead, he Valmiki chooses to emphasize that Hanuman is thinking about what language to use. It, it also serves a larger um, purpose here. Valmiki is also introducing the reader to the idea that Hanuman is familiar with several languages. So Hanuman has a word that Valmiki gives him called Hanuman Vakkovidaha. Vakkovidaha means mm -hmm. he's very proficient, very fluent in multiple languages. So what he describes about him, he shows it in action somewhere else. So it, it becomes a way of communicating multiple ideas. And I think that's what makes Valmiki such a fantastic uh, storyteller. Yes. And uh, also a wonderful implementation of storytelling techniques, right? You yes. are introducing yeah. to the motivations of the person, not yeah. just yeah telling that this is what he will do. You're actually going one step further. Absolutely. Oh, and, and if you look at Valmiki's attention to detail, um, the way he becomes such a master storyteller, he knows when to employ ideas like suspense, um, friction, how to be able to hold a, a plot. But he also knows where to let empathy be the predominant force. So for example, mm -hmm. um, if, if one were to look at uh, a modern way of, of doing things, not that there's anything wrong with it, but 
if if I had to reimagine how it would look when Hanuman returns back to the shores to tell everybody that he has seen Sita, he could easily begin saying, you know, from the time I left, from the time I took off all the way to the shores of Lanka, these are all the things happened that happened. And then he could mention eventually that he saw Sita. But the first words he tells everybody is that I had the darshanam of Sita. I saw Sita and then he proceeds. Because in that mm-hmm. moment, the storyline or the plot is not... you know, the the suspense element is not that important. What is important is to reassure everybody there because they have been waiting for Hanuman. So he immediately identifies that and he shares that. So Valmiki was able to employ techniques like this to be able to say storytelling is not always about the action-packed moments. Sometimes it's about the simplest of moments, which is reassurance in this case. So he employed many, many such techniques, actually. Yeah, and that's that's fascinating. Even the second example which you gave, it's almost like a, and you said that it could be a social reflection, obviously, yeah. when, when we talk about, but it's also something which we often see in, in tantric texts as well. Mm-hmm. When, when the Devi description is there, yeah. the earlier descriptions are very, they're very strict and they are, they're, they're really very robust. Yeah. And slowly as we came down in centuries, they got more mellowed and they had yeah. more, almost like a more householder kind of a touch, yes, which, which went forward. And I, I think that's, that's also because, um, the the larger idea of Sita in Valmiki Ramayana, if one were to just research about her, she emerges like a goddess. She emerges like a an unfearful, a very confident goddess. Hmm. But the versions change also because our response to colonialism also changed. We had to we had to now adapt to the idea that yes, a woman is now a submissive role who is who is in the shadow of her uh, husband. But in reality, as you said, in tantric texts, in the Shakta understanding of things, uh, Sita is not a Abala Nari who is sitting under a tree and crying. She, in fact, in the Valmiki Ramayana itself, she says, if I wished, I could have brought an end to Ravana, but I chose not to because he didn't say that I should do it. So it suggests, again, something else, that there's a deeper narrative and a deeper understanding that she has about her role. But in when this got popularized into... Um, in, let's say into movies, into books, into more modern adaptations, it, it became difficult to explore these layers because they become more abridged versions. So how could you communicate all this idea that, okay, Sita is suggesting that she's aware that Rama has a divine role to come and kill Rama. So therefore it becomes easier for Sita to just languish away, you know, under the forest, under the tree and, and just be sad. But in reality, there's a larger narrative that runs there in that you see in the in the older versions of the Rama, particularly the Varmi of course. Yeah, and I mean, I guess this remains a, po- a topic for another podcast as to why and how this this happened. Mm-hmm. But I would assume that somewhere also the role of different languages. So Sanskrit lends to being extremely concise and mm. it can communicate a lot in the minimal yeah. minimal version it is. And yeah. most of the other languages which follow, they need a larger kind of a setting before they can convey the same idea. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming somewhere that too played a part. But again, that's that's fascinating how it changed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, moving on, Vinay, uh, there are there are certain themes or certain topics which, uh, which again, coming back to what we started to discuss in this podcast is the relevance, the significance of Ramayana in today's time mm-hmm. and certain themes which we would like to explore. Mm-hmm. The first one is... I would say the most obvious one is the role and the topic of faith. Beautiful. And okay. I think that's a uh, that's an interesting topic because it's, I mean, as the scientific methodology, the empirical method started emerging, hmm. there has been a very almost like a anti-role change between faith. And it, it almost seems like these are two different right. antagonizing right. sides right. of any human psychology. Yeah. So... How do we understand faith? What does Ramayana tell us about faith and how does it become relevant to you and me today? I think that's a very beautiful question because um, as you said, faith is seen somewhat contradictory to the idea of rational thinking. But I think the Ramayana holds that one thread constantly that faith is at the center of the universe, if I can say so, in a, in a less literal and a more metaphorical sense because if we look at the different characters that emerge uh, through the epic, each of the protagonists, whether it is Rama, whether it is Lakshmana, whether it is Sita, whether it is Hanuman, if you keep Rama aside for the sake of this discussion and you look at the other three, it is their faith in a larger system. It is their faith in in something beyond or outside of themselves, inclusive but outside of themselves, that enables them to be able to, to embark on their journeys. Because it is... Mm-hmm. 
Um, unlike a very black and white painting of faith in the Ramayana, you see you see moments where faith also dips. You see moments where people are wondering, okay, what's happening? Why is this happening to me? Because we even again when we look at uh, cinematic adaptations of this, this part gets missed out. But Rama himself loses hope completely when Sita is nowhere to be seen. And he threatens, of course, he threatens to bring the universe down to ashes and all of this. But he pines for Sita. And at that point, one really wonders, is, does he have any faith left in the system? No, because his, his despair is so intense. Lakshmana also goes through moments like that. Hanuman also goes through moments like that, which we can also explore in another context um, uh, of what it suggests about their, their mental dynamic and what's happening. But faith as a theme is touched upon very, very beautifully because the one core principle of faith, which has, I think, been lost in a lot of um, uh, mixed interpretations, is the idea that faith is not, it's not always being able to be balanced throughout and just let, um, you know, sadness and grief come and go. Faith is also about holding on to that idea while experiencing those elements. So I'll give you one beautiful example. We can't find this moment towards the end of the Kishkin the Kanda where um, what has happened is Sugriva has dispatched four sets of Vanaras to north, south, east, west, across the different parts to find Sita. These are all search parties. Now, in these search parties, the, the troop that has come to the south, which is led by Angada and has Hanuman and Jambavan and the other important Vanaras here, this troop has not found any sign of Sita. So they are getting a little angsty as well about it because they know that they have a timeline to go back. Sugriva gives them one month. They go back. I mean, they're not yet gone back. They're waiting. They're trying to see, okay, they have some larger clues that suggest wh where she might be, but there's nothing concrete enough to go ahead. Now, it is at this point when they're sitting not too far from the shore, but not at the shore. And they sit there and realize, what is, what is the point of this? You know, just look at what has happened. And they sit and they, they do something very interesting. They're all sitting around, except for Hanuman, all of them participate in this. And one says, you know why this is all happening? We're all going to die now, firstly, because when we go back with no good news to Sugriva, he's going to kill us. That's what he said. He said, return with good news or don't return. And if you return, your heads will be chopped off. So they have this fear um, of their leader killing them anyway on their head. So now in that fear, which is a very normal emotion, um, in this, they start to look at the entire events of the Ramayana themselves and they start to criticize it. This is a very counterintuitive, might look like a counterintuitive example of faith, but I find it very fascinating because over here, what happens is they, they look at Kaikai and one Vanara says, you know why this is all happening? This is happening because Kaikai influenced Dasharatha to send Rama to the forest. Had she not done that, Rama would not have gone to the forest. Then another says, had Rama not gone to the forest, then Sita would not have been kidnapped. Then another says, had Ravana not taken after Sita like that, we would not be in this situation. So everybody starts to link their own grief to this one happening of Sita's kidnapping and Kaikei's sending of Rama to the forest, which is fine. But effectively what they are doing, if you just zoom out and see, effectively they are just re retelling the entire Ramayana from start till now. One is talking about Kaikei Dasharatha, one is talking about Rama's coming all the way to Dandakaranya, one is talking about Karadushana, etc., etc. It's building up. But ultimately, it's the story of Rama. And it is hearing this story, one of them says, you know, what would have saved us? Suppose Jatayu had been able to save Sita when Ravana was taking her away. At that, If that had happened, then we would be safe. When they said this, all of a sudden, in next to them, very close to where they are sit, seated, is where there's an old dried branch. And there's a vulture who can barely move. That vulture hears the word Jatayu and he screams. And he says, who said my brother's name? This vulture is none other than Sampati. Sampati is the brother of Jatayu. He wasn't paying any attention to the Vanaras at all. But the second he heard the word, the name Jatayu, he came and said, what is this? So then they related the whole story to him. He says, oh, so Jatayu is my brother, but you were looking for Ravana. I know where Ravana lives. He's on the other side of the shore. He's in Lanka. Go there. So all this happens. Why? This happens because of the power of faith. Even in their despair, even though it is criticizing Rama, they're not criticizing Rama, they're criticizing the circumstances that have led to it. At the core of their, their, their um, unhappiness is something to do with the divine. So the, the faith here is shown as a very indirect example saying, even if you're criticizing the divine, even if you're criticizing circumstances that have led you, you have not led, left go of your faith. If you've not let go of your faith, your way ahead is shown. So their way ahead is shown actually in some senses because they complain. 
that's how sampati points towards lanka and that's how the that troop eventually sends hanuman over there so it's a very fascinating um, connection in terms of what is what, how can faith be able to tide you through difficult times without everybody constantly being in a state of equilibrium because that's not um, necessarily easy for everybody it works for some but it's not a one size fits all so yeah yeah do you're right it's a, it's a very fairly non typical example mm. of faith <laughs> yeah but uh, there there are certain even again there are, the, there are these micro uh, you know threads which we can take from here one is just i mean if you take it in in a very short segment is how faith unravels yeah so yeah. if if we are in a difficult situation we look back oh it was his fault no it was his fault no it was his fault and it starts unraveling right right and then obviously this is the larger context that even when it's unraveling they still had the faith this was rama's story and this did eventually lead exactly. to them finding Absolutely. where their destination was like you said this is this is a lesser um, lesser explored or a lesser touched upon idea but you see more direct um uh expressions of how faith is held on to with so much of conviction because faith and conviction mm-hmm. go together that's another theme that is explored very beautifully in the ramayana so for this, for this i think a beautiful example comes when um hanuman is busy he is getting ready to burn up lanka and uh, when he's doing this so when does this happen this happens after he has met sita then he goes and destroys ashokavanam then he is taken to ravana where ravana decides that let this guy um, let his tail be burnt and then hanuman decides that okay i can use this opportunity to burn lanka and scare the enemy now when hanuman is doing that the rakshasis who are with sita they come to sita and they say look that monkey who was with you that vanara who was with you um this vanara is get is going and burning the city of lanka down so i think he's going to get burnt as well because his his tail is set on fire that's all they tell him that's all they tell sita now when she hears this sita is a little panicky because she thinks hanuman has come predominantly for me he has come to find mm-hmm. me and now his tail is being set on fire what can i do such that hanuman does not get affected while he is burning all of lanka now this is the conviction that sita displays because sita can easily utter a prayer here because faith is often translated into prayer but sita's conviction is such that when she is praying she is showcasing what she has with her and she is almost making a trade with that so she says something very interesting she says if she makes three conditions the first one we'll we'll touch upon she says if i have been keen and if i have been um desperate for nothing but rama to come and take me back and if rama knows this fact then let hanuman still be cool so the in the rama in valmiki ramayanam he says yadi mam dritta sampannam tat samagama lalasa if he knows savijanaati dharmaatma if that dharmaatma meaning rama knows that i have been true to my vrata i have been true to my husband savijanaati dharmaatma shito bhava hanumatah then may hanuman be cool three times she says may hanuman be cool and it's a conviction it's not oh all of you protect hanuman that's a different approach but here she's saying hanuman will be cool because i have been true to my dharma and my dharma will never fail me this is the idea of dharma rakshati rakshata that she she displays it saying if i have been true then the devatas will respond to that truth and hanuman will be uh, will be protected as soon as she utters these three shlokams hanuman parallelly after he has burnt all of lanka he sits down and wonders i have burnt the entire city down and i am unable to figure out why is my tail feeling so cool and he says there are three reasons for this one the first one is rama prabhavat aashcharyam i am amazed at the the glory of rama by which this has happened the second is this is the power of sita's tapas and the third is because my father that is uh, pavana the wind god maruti uh, so marutkana and agni fire and wind are friends because one fuels the other mm. so he says that is the only reason that i my tail has been protected so here also hanuman's example is beautiful in terms of the 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 humility that he shows but sita's example is the faith that comes with conviction the faith that comes when you remain true to your ideals you're in a position to be able to almost demand and i think that's forms a very interesting and a different approach to faith that we see in ramayana it does and it also actually when we talk about faith and conviction together it lends the robustness which is usually missing when we talk about yes. faith these days yes absolutely yeah yeah very very true and 
Yeah, and and I think that is that conviction. And again, this is something which which comes out at least from Valmiki Ramayan again and again is is the the absolute sturdiness yeah. which which characters display even in terms of even in good times and bad times. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but one final thread from faith, Vinay, is is the concept of faith on oneself and faith on an, on a power which is which is beyond oneself. Are these two threads also explored when we when we talk about Ramayana? Absolutely, um, and I think the best example for this is someone like Hanuman because when um, we look at him as a character, in terms of the kind of situations he has to deal with, because there is a reason that he is called Ramayana Mahamala Ratnam, that he is the gem or he is the the central pendant for a mala for a necklace that is the Ramayana, because. He holds together the story very evidently from a storyline perspective. Also, if we look, it is he who makes that ultimate jump to Lanka and does all of these things. But from the perspective of faith, he balances Rama's um, despondency. He man- manages Sita's despair, brings them to be able to to hold their own faith, and at the same time, he struggles with his own faith. He also uh, struggles is probably the wrong word, but he he manages his equation with his own faith. Because when he's leaving, so this this moment is very beautiful. When he's about to leave, um, when he has to make this jump to Lanka, which he knows is a hundred yojanas far. So all mm-hmm. the other Vanaras have said only Hanuman can do it. And it is only now that Jambavan has reminded Hanuman that Hanuman, as a child, you had these powers. I am awakening, I mean, I'm reminding you of what you're capable of. So go and do that. So Hanuman is ready to do it. Now, at this point, as you said, one may think, is it faith in Rama that he needs or is it faith within himself? Because faith in Rama would suggest that, okay, this is completely Rama. There is no part me. But Hanuman says, I am leaving like an arrow that has been discharged by Rama. And what I mean is that I will not return without success because what Rama discharges is never unsuccessful. So on one hand, you can see his conviction in Rama. But at the same time, you can also see his conviction in himself that now that I am leaving like this, now that I'm leaving with Rama's blessings, I will return successfully. So there is a good amount of self-confidence here, which doesn't border into arrogance. It's not who can defeat me. It is, I am aware of what strengths I'm going with, but these strengths are given to me by a larger power. So there is that healthy balance between being able to ascribe this to a larger or to an external force, because Rama here is a for us would mean an external Rama who is a character. But for Hanuman, he sees that Rama in the center of his own heart. So he, see, he says, this is the source of my power. When this is the source of my power, I don't have to worry because this source is energizing me altogether. So he makes that, that beautiful, it's almost a, a manual for how do, you, how do you navigate your own self-confidence where you are not underconfident and you are not overconfident because both are uh, detrimental to the cause ultimately. Both can can hamper your final success. If you are uh, struggling with either an inferiority or a superiority complex, both will get in the way of you actually achieving what you're supposed to. But finding that mid path, it's it's possible when when you're able to link an external and an internal faith together. Yes, and I think that's I mean just this this part when we say faith upon oneself. Mm. If I say it by myself, that has a good tendency to merge into arrogance or overconfidence. Yeah. But here, Jamvant is telling Hanuman that you can do this yourself. That Absolutely. Hanuman has the faith in somebody else that okay, it's because of him that I can do it. So that balance then just creates just the right amount of confidence to just jump. Absolutely. And and this just brings me to to quickly share on the same line. Somebody once asked Ramakrishna Paramahamsa this question as to which mm. is required. Do we need confidence in ourselves, or do we need grace from the divine to be able to perform a task? So Paramahamsa in response asked this person to bring a scissors and cut a paper. So he cut, cuts a paper with it. So after he cut the paper, he said, okay, now I want to ask you a question uh, back. I want you to tell me which of the two blades in that scissors cut the paper. So he says, I, I, can't, I can't answer that. And he says, exactly. So if you view the two blades as Devanugraham, which is uh, grace of the divine, and um, Atma Balam, that is your self-confidence, both of these are required for you to be able to actually uh, you know, get your job done. So you cannot say that it works with only one. You cannot say which one it is that is working either. It is both the need to move uh, at a confluence for your task to be achieved. So... I just thought that 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 line is exactly oh, yeah. where we are at. So it, that's why it is. And if if either of the blades is dull, then you can't cut it. You can't cut it exactly. It's there. Uh, moving on, Vinay is, is 
again, I think this is also why we have so many versions and translations of Ramayana is the power of human emotions, which oh, is yeah. Yeah. which is there right from the beginning to the end. And that theme keeps on playing. Absolutely. Uh, what do we have to learn from there and understand from, from that aspect? So I think the emergence of, of emotions and the fact that emotions get space to be able to emerge, um, that's very beautiful for me personally in the Ramayana. That it is not, it's not about choking an emotion and saying, okay, okay, there's no time for this right now. When somebody is grieving, their grievance is also given chapters. Um, in fact, if you look at the, the, the conversation between Bharata and Rama, Again, we assume it to be a very quick conversation where, you know, Bharata comes and then he begs Rama and Rama says, no, go away. I'm not going to, I have to uh, fulfill the promise that we made. We, you must go. And then Bharata takes the padukas and uh, takes the, the footwear and goes in the sl slippers and goes back. But the actual conversation between them, it goes into several chapters. And it is so heartwarming because at some point Bharata breaks down and he says, you know, after Rama has convinced him entirely with logic, at this point, Bharata breaks down, listens to Rama, is calm, and then he breaks down and he says, fine, if you're not going to come back to Ayodhya Rama, then I will sit here in a fast and I will not move until you decide to take on kingship of Ayodhya all over again. He sits down into the, in the, on the cottage floor where Rama is. And Rama looks at him and he says, Bharata, we just discussed this. I cannot, I cannot let go of this vow. Bharata says, no, then I also am making a vow. I also have something uh, to say. And this is what I have to say. So that navigation between emotions, that human emotion for him is, Bharata is also ashamed that his mother has gone and made this commitment on his behalf. But he, for Bharata, he's carrying that guilt that the world will think I wanted this. He doesn't want that. For him, he loves Rama with all his heart. And that sadness that he has to be away from his brother for 14 years, that sadness is overwhelming. So no amount of logic works on him. So this is again a beautiful idea of human emotions that when somebody is sad, if you say, I will give you reasons not to be sad, this is what we call toxic positivity, right? When you just, somebody's sad and you tell them, yeah, but here's somebody sadder than you. And that's a very poor way of being able to help them come to terms with their emotions. So Rama has already given him all the logic. Rama has even explained to him how to run the country in his absence, but it doesn't work on Bharata. Not that he's not competent, but for him, this, this emotion is very, very alive right now. So in that moment, finally, Rama realizes that the only way to pull him out of sadness is to be able to navigate his emotion towards something else because Bharata is not able to see beyond his emotion. So therefore, Rama points him to a larger compass and says, Bharata, our father gave Kaikai a promise. He gave her two boats. Now, for our father's words to be honored, I have done my part, which is that I stepped away for 14 years. But our father's word will only be honored if you do your part as well. So it's not only dependent on me, Bharata. You sitting here like this on a fast until I return is dishonoring what our father said. So please rise to this occasion and do what you need to do. Now, this is that beautiful balance of how do you manage somebody when they are, they are in an emotional turmoil as well, right? This is Rama handling that situation very delicately as opposed to just dismissing Bharata saying, no, dharma is dharma. There's a gentle, there's a way to approach it in such a way that everybody concerned is able to make their own peace with the situation. So human emotions find a, a very, very um, interesting expression throughout the Ramayana. I think human emotions and also, so this is, this is of course a very serious example. If we had to take something in slight, um, I wouldn't say lighter vein, but something less heady, um, we find this exactly at, at the end of Kishkinda Kanda, where all the Vanaras have now, thanks to Sampati, they have discovered that Sita is in Lanka, that Ravana has taken her there, and they've established the distance between the shore and Lanka. So now they all know it's 100 Yojanas wide. Now, in this moment, Jambavan immediately knows that Hanuman is the one who's going to do it. But interestingly, he doesn't ask Hanuman first. He asks all of the other Vanaras, one by one, he goes to them and he says, can you do it? So one of them says, look, I can go, but I'm not sure if I can come back. One says, I can leap only halfway. I might drop into the sea over there. Finally, he comes to Hanuman and he says, Hanuman, you can do it. Now look at this interesting idea, right? Instead of directly going to Hanuman, the reason that Jambavan um, chooses this method could well be because, you know, when, when we have suppressed emotions, where later Jambavan knows Hanuman is going to get a lot of credit for this. At that point, if somebody should get slightly jealous, then they might say, you know what? They actually, Jambavan asked Hanuman, if he had asked me, I would have also done it. So this is also mm -hmm. a, a management of an emotion where you get somebody to accept their uh, their limits and their capacities in the beginning itself. 
at which point no one can later turn a finger point a finger at hanuman and say i would have done it if i had a chance because everybody accepted their own weakness as well so the the emotions how to be able to manage those emotions all of these come out as like very very interesting uh, subplots if i can call it that in the course uh, of the epic in mul- in multiple retellings this is these two examples that i gave are both found in the valmiki ramayana but there are regional retellings where different uh, emotions have different expressions altogether yes and uh... there is also i mean i think you mentioned it but there is a comfort in giving space to emotions mm. yeah. so nothing is being brushed aside nothing, nothing is being yeah. said that okay this is what it is and you should do it there is a space given to both the emotion as well as the characters reasons or motivations in that emotion and then the addressing of that emotion absolutely absolutely and and that's what takes it away from being a very uh, a book where you know it is a, it's a law book of sorts it's not because if you look at the things that bharata says to kai kai when she when he returns and he finds out what has happened he doesn't know he is not there at the time when rama is banished and dasharatha dies all of this comes to him as a shock so if you look at him purely from from the perspective of somebody who is going through an emotional upheaval now he the things he says to kai kai one would easily question them saying can a son speak to a mother like this he's ready to kill her and he says i would have killed you had it not been for the fact that rama does not rama would not appreciate it. that's the only reason i'm keeping you alive i'm ashamed to call you my mother hence for you are dead to me he says things like this to her which are very harsh but again the context is important the fact that 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 emotion needs to emerge from him and mm. that there needs to be a space for him to do that because kai kai also says i did all this for you uh, and and that there in this moment it's human emotions if you take away the the angle that we also typically naturally ascribe to kai kai which is that of a very selfish woman who has her motives kai kai is also extremely fond of rama prior to that incident it is something that enters her brain and i heard this very beautifully in a in a discourse that said this is a rishi sankalpa this is a a decision of rishis elsewhere that kai kai has to get influence now because otherwise rama won't go but when we mm. look it's and we keep aside that aspect of kai kai If you look here is a mother who also just did all this for her child and now this child has come back and he's rejected all of it all together and said what the hell did you do so she is also turned into absolute turmoil saying but it was for you because i lost my husband now and the whole kingdom hates me and i did this for you and now you are saying you don't want it so that reconciliation you know how do they manage those kind of situations with each other that's that's where you see that each of these emotions is valid each of these emotions has their place and in the larger narrative they they do play their part as well right and in between the sea of these human emotions there is still rama who emerges as the ideal man and so yeah. that itself is is a very precise description of the perfect person anybody should mm-hmm. should aim to become uh so i i think um the the beauty of rama is again that rama's emotions also he he allows them to to emerge but the difference is um when his emotions are emerging also we can see the way he engages with them that's very beautiful because we see that when just imagine for a man who is expecting that he's going to be king in a few hours and he's suddenly summoned to his father's court so he's wondering is there you know is there a change of the time is there a change of schedule and there he goes and finds out this information the first person that he must inform after this act is his mother now one would imagine a a child who has just been you know he's just been robbed in some senses of what he was what was rightfully his but now he no longer has access to this and he no longer has um, the entire kingdom has literally just slipped out of his fingers and he has to go and tell his mother this when he goes to kausalya's chamber at this point she is performing a yagyam for his um coronation for his patta bishek she is unaware of what has happened in this moment rama could easily go and break down at kausalya saying do you know what happened this is what happened inside there i'm sad but i have to go but we don't see rama doing this very stoically he says amma please bless me because i must go but i must go for a different purpose now i'm not going to become mm-hmm. a king right now i have to go for to an exile at this point kausalya's emotions also drop rama has his own emotions rama is not showing a hint of what is going on inside this is the beauty of rama it's not that he's not processing things it's not that he he ha- we cannot get a hint on what is going on we see a hint of how rama feels only when he goes back to tell sita at that point we see that all of this this emotional upheaval has kind of 
it's settled down inside Rama and he says, this is what has happened. But when he's talking to Kausalya, he says, Amma, don't lose hope because he's holding space for Kausalya. He knows in this moment, if he also breaks down, just imagine what's going to happen. She will immediately go and stage something in front of Dasharatha saying, how can you do this to me? I'll, mm-hmm. I'll kill myself in this moment. Something like that. Anything can happen. But he holds his emotion over there. But when, like we said earlier, when it comes to Sita's loss, he's not, he's beside rage. Even besides this, in the war, there are two instances when Lakshmana is critically ill. In both those instances, he says, what war, what life, what kingdom, what Sita? That also he says over there saying, what is the point of anything if I don't have Lakshmana by my side? I will, there is no point for anything at all. There's no point in living anymore. So Rama's emotions also emerge in that moment with, and again, this is, it's important to take an example like this and not, um, not shade it saying, oh, so he didn't love Sita. Oh, he, that, that's not at all. The idea. It's just in this moment, his brotherly love for Lakshmana just expresses itself like this. So you see moments like this where his emotions also come to the forefront, but how he allows them to quickly pass and then realize that, okay, I am not the emotion. That is why the, 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 the context of the beginning of the Ramayana itself is when um, Valmiki asks, Konvasmin Sampratham Loke Gunavan Kashta Viryavan. And he says, in this present world, is there anybody who has those qualities? Gunavan Kashta Viryavan, Dharma Gnyashta Krita Gnyashta Satyavak Dridavrataha. Is there someone who is, who is bound by Dharma? Is there somebody who shows gratitude to others? That's another beautiful way in which Rama's emotions emerge. That wherever somebody does something for him, he is always showing gratitude back to that person. Whether it is Guha, the ferryman, uh, the tribal ferryman who ferries them across uh, to the other side of the river, or it is to Jatayu, because Rama and Jatayu meet twice and they first set up ashram in Panchavati. Jatayu comes and he says, I'm your father's old friend. So Rama says, whenever you are, would like to, you're most welcome to visit. And finally, just uh, uh, an interpretation says this beautifully. It says, Jatayu came and he spoke to Rama. And after this, he tried his best to save Sita. But what did he get in return? He got the fortune that even Dasharatha could not get himself. His, he got his body to be burnt by Rama, who is none other than Narayana himself. So um, when you do something for love with Paramatma, how Paramatma responds to that is how Rama's responses to emotions are in the entire Ramayana. This is the most beautiful example of this is, of course, Shabari herself, how he responds to Shabari. Interestingly, though, in the Valmiki Ramayana, there is no mention of Shabari tasting the fruits and giving it to him. That we find only in other Ramayanas. In the Valmiki Ramayana, they are just going past. Rama and Lakshmana are on their way looking for Sugriva. They are looking for um, the mountain, uh, Kishkindha. And um, when they are doing this, they hear the words Rama being chanted. And at that point, they go and they enter Matanga Muni's uh, hermitage where an old lady is waiting for them and she is Shabri. And the equation, that brief interaction that Shabri and Rama share, where he, she takes him around the ashram and she says, I was just waiting for you to come. Now that you have come, I can go in peace. She feeds him and then Shabri enters into a vimanam, into an aircraft and she goes into Swargam. Rama foresees all of Rama watches all of this and he watches it with such joy because this is conveyed as a theme that when you wait for the divine, the divine will respond to you in ways that you have, could not have imagined. So these kind of sub themes where emotions also connect to a larger idea become very beautiful. But even if you just studied emotions alone in the Ramayana, it makes a great study. It does. And, and there are these, the, the points which you mentioned and many others where, where emotions will transcend logic and rationality for yeah. that micro moment. Yes. But then how do you deal with it? Yes. And those are, those are depicted very, very beautifully. Absolutely. Perfect. So carrying on Vinay is, is the final theme which we'd like to touch today is, is again a theme which not many would, would associate Ramayana with. It's, mm-hmm. it's mental health. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that obviously is extremely, extremely relevant Absolutely. today where we are. Absolutely. So, how do you go about that and how, what do you gain out of Ramayana for that topic? So I think the, um, the beauty in something like Ramayana is the, the space in the narrative for how for mental health to emerge as a theme. There are moments that look very, very glum. There are moments when it feels like, okay, everything is almost at stake. Typically what happens in most of our storytelling is that we, we tend to equate and compare the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, saying, no, that the, the plot is far more developed in the Mahabharata as opposed to Ramayana. 
Um, I think that's a more black and white reading because the Ramayana has a lot of um, a lot of sublinear text, a lot of things that are happening below the surface. That one, if one examines that storyline, one is able to catch such moments. So now let's take this moment um, which we touched upon earlier, which is Hanuman has arrived in Lanka. Now he arrives at Lanka late into the night. He spends the entire night searching for Sita. And during this, there is this internalized idea or this internalized, I will not say pressure, but this focus that I have come here. Because as we said, when he left, he said, I will not be unsuccessful. I will be like mm-hmm. a, an arrow that drama has shot. I will be successful. Now, a whole night has passed. He has gone through every chamber, everywhere, and he has not found Sita. So this moment is very interesting because if we, if we just directly don't find something in life, if we're not able to achieve something and we're dejected, it's different. But Hanuman had almost a glimpse of what success looked like because when he enters one of the palaces next to Ravana in another bed by herself, he sees a glowing woman sleeping and he's thrilled. He says, I found Sita. Look at her. She's glowing with the radiance of a thousand moons. That is Sita indeed. And he just jumps up from the window where he is. Then he immediately stops himself in a minute and he says, what am I doing? How can that be Sita? Will Sita sleep? Number two, will Sita be so close to Ravana? Number three, will Sita lie on a hap- on a silken mattress like this in such a sound state of rest when she is away from mm-hmm. Rama? This cannot be her. The one that he sees is Mandodri. But in terms of emotions now, in terms of Hanuman's mental state, he, he left with this much of confidence, with a massive amount of confidence. But now it's tapering because the whole night is gone. All of Lanka has been scourged by him and there's no sign of Sita. So what do you do in a moment like this? Then Hanuman's mind starts to race. And he says, okay, now... I have not seen Sita. It's almost morning. Further, if I go back like this, what's going to happen? Rama is going to be disappointed. If Rama is going to be disappointed, he's going to lose hope in life. If Rama loses hope in life, Lakshmana will lose hope in life. If Lakshmana loses hope in life, Sugriva, on whom they both depended, will also be absolutely unhappy with himself. If Sugriva is unhappy with himself and kills himself, the entire Vanarasena will follow the same. Now, if news that Rama and Lakshmana have killed themselves reaches the Ikshvakuvamsham, then Bharata and Shatrugra will no longer be able to live, etc., etc., etc. So all of everybody is going to die. Everybody is going to kill themselves. Everybody is dependent on me. This is all happening because of me. This is what Hanuman tells us. In an entire chapter, Valmiki describes it at such speed that you realize this is the pace of the mind. That in this moment, there's, there's no rational. There's just, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's just panic button after panic button after panic button. Saying everything is be- is dependent on me and I have failed. So you know what? It is best if I just die. Because if I go back now, I don't have any good news to take. So if I go back like this, I, this is what I'm going to do. So instead, what is the best thing to do? I'll just stay here and die. Nobody will ever know. They'll keep thinking that I'll come. But that's better no, than actually going and telling them this. You, you draw parallel to this and to Arjuna Vishada Yoga, which is the first chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. You will see how anxiety, how absolute um, grief, how panic can can become a very convincing narrative. Uh, Arjuna Vishwara Yoga is also very convincing in itself, saying, oh yeah, this makes sense, actually, if you think about it. Hanuman's logic also makes sense. And when he's about to do something to himself, at that point, Hanuman thinks to himself and says, he says a very beautiful thing in the Valmiki Ramayana. He says, Vinasho bahuvo doshaha jivan prapnoti bhadraka. There are a host of um, doshas, a host of accrued uh, karma that comes when I destroy a life that I'm not meant to destroy because I'm not meant to take life. Fundamentally, again, faith. Faith here is this underarching theme that no matter how much I hate this present situation, I cannot, this is beyond my control, this is beyond my circle of control. This is a very beautiful thing that Hanuman says one minute before committing suicide. He says, life must be guarded carefully. Jeevan prapnoti bhadraka. Life itself, receiving life, and guarding that life is a necessity because if I die today, there's no chance I'll ever find Sita. There's no chance anybody will find Sita. But should I stay alive, then someday or the other, there will be a hope. Someday I will be able to achieve my mission. So Hanuman's quick reconciliation with himself, where he's now hit rock bottom, but he makes that peace with himself and he says, if I stay alive, I will find hope. Okay, I didn't find her here in Lanka. Fine, I will look elsewhere. If not Lanka, I look in Patala, I look above in Swargaloka, I look in the seas, I look. I will stay here otherwise and I'll keep looking somewhere or the other, she will show up. So he starts, now the conversation with himself starts to take a different turn. But what was that turning point for him? The turning point for him was that attribution 
దట్ వేర్ ఆర్ మై మేకింగ్ దిస్ డిసిషన్ ఫ్రమ్ హనుమాన్ మేక్స్ అ వెరీ ఐకానిక్ శ్లోక ఇన్ ద వాల్మీకి రామాయణం హీ సెస్ అనిర్దేశో అనిర్వేదో శ్రేయో మూలం అనిర్వేద నిర్వేదన ఇస్ దట్ స్టేట్ ఆఫ్ డిస్పేర్ నిర్వేదన ఇస్ కంపేర్డ్ ఇన్ మోడర్న్ డే టైమ్ మోడర్న్ టైమ్స్ టు సమ్ సార్ట్ ఆఫ్ యాంగ్జైటీ అటాక్ ఇఫ్ ఐ కెన్ కాల్ ఇట్ దాట్ బట్ అన్ అబ్సల్యూట్ వన్ వేర్ ఇట్స్ టేకెన్ ఓవర్ ఆల్ రాషనల్ థింకింగ్ అండ్ ద బాడీ ఈస్ కంప్లీట్లీ ఆపరేటింగ్ ఆన్ ఫైట్ ఆఫ్ లైట్ ఇన్ సచ్ అ మూమెంట్ దట్ మూమెంట్ ఇస్ కాల్డ్ నిర్వేదన వేర్ ద డిసిషన్స్ దట్ వి మేక్ ఆర్ ఆల్సో గైడెడ్ ప్యూర్లీ బై ఇమోషన్స్ అండ్ నో ఓవర్ ఆర్చింగ్ లాజిక్ ఇన్ సచ్ అ మూమెంట్ the only thing the or the opposite of that is called anirvedana where you are not in a state of panic you are able to distance yourself from what you are feeling and say okay i am feeling all these things but there is a truth beyond my feelings right now beyond my feelings lies certain objective truths am i able to touch base with them when hanuman is able to touch base with them he says that let me make anir um, uh, anirvedo sarvarthesho pravartaka he says towards the end of the shloka he says let all decisions or these decisions should be informed by that state of balancedness my decisions should not come from my emotions alone they should come from that healthy mid space so when you take a character like hanuman it's a beautiful way of looking at mental health where suicide is not a oh my goodness we should not even think of it no suicide is at some point in our lives many of us come in in very close proximity to such an idea we do have moments when we feel like giving up and we feel like none of this is worth it you know i i i do i'm not able to get past this day and if a character who is so close to the heart like hanuman because he's one of the most endearing characters in the ramayana is able to take that moment and say beyond this lies hope then that is where mental health starts to find emergence because what hanu it's also so beautiful in terms of a story like if somebody has and like hanuman has to in a few minutes he's going to meet sita and when he meets sita she is also contemplating suicide interesting so if he has to console her he has to know what that feels like as well so he first experiences it unknowing of all this he experiences it within and after he experiences it is that's that's why he's able to convince sita with such not just rational but with such emotional support where he keep, he identifies what is triggering her right now and how do i need to be able to respond to that trigger is able to do that because he's he's sure of himself you can hold space and you can hold comfort or or lend support to someone else when you yourself are in a space of healthy operation so in this sense mental health here is it moves from being able to hold space for oneself and what's emerging but also being able to identify am i in a state to give support to someone else and if so do i know what kind of support they need because hanuman identifies that very very beautifully and that's how he manages to stop sita from committing suicide as well so uh, this is of course just a scratch on the surface but uh, the overarching theme of mental health is it's seen in multiple places in the ramayana i thought hanuman is the most beautiful example to to have touched upon that yeah so there is there's actually a lot to unpack there i'll, I'll just again it, it's a huge topic so i'll just touch on a few points so one is uh, is the ability of our mind to weave stories right it's it's a it's a phenomenal storyteller absolutely and it can create these these stories and all these instances which then pull us further down into the spiral of thinking there's nothing to be gained absolutely like nothing can be done now let's let's just finish it once and for all uh, then there is this theme which you mentioned of the point of turning right. where we are able to take a distance from whatever has covered or enveloped our mind and it's yeah. almost a almost that vedantic theme of sada sakshi or the witnessing yes, nature yes. of of consciousness where you can take a step back and see okay this is this is just another thought in between all of these thoughts and Absolutely. i can take a step back and and come to rationality but yeah there is there is a lot to unpack here and it probably require another session but that's uh, the the third part which i think is fascinating here is to whom is this despair occurring it's it's not occurring to any common person like us it's it's occurring to to hanuman right mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. the bravest character in in all the in the lore right the the person Absolutely. even today right we are right, even when it comes to bhut preet or something else right, that yes. is the name we are we are remembering and it is to that hanuman whom despair can take hold of yeah. and to the point where he thinks that okay let's just finish right nothing yeah, can be yeah. gained here yeah and even to that person from that point there is a place to take a distance and come back and then take yes. the next step absolutely that that's that's yeah, very wonderful vinan and thanks again for sharing that that example uh 
as we, we move on to the close, and again, as I said, all of these three themes, faith, human emotions, and, and mental health, uh, are, are very, very broad themes. So we perhaps would, would touch them more in the future, but uh, these has, have been very fascinating examples. Uh, and, and you've shared a lot of them, but before we end, is there, is there something, any particular shloka or saying or, or something which you, which you feel has stayed with you and has been, the, has been something which you get inspired by a lot? So I think um, two things come to my mind. Uh, both are to do with Hanuman and Rama. I think one for me is about the timelessness of the epic. The fact that this epic speaks to us at different stages of our life, that itself for me is timelessness. It's not about literally this being timeless. Um, and a very beautiful story illustrates this. When um, uh, the famous ring, the one that uh, Rama gives to Hanuman and says, give this to Sita when you see her, he gives it to her, etc. And then once they come back and um, the, the Patabhishekam is over, many, many, many years later, when he's ruling, uh, Rama asks, uh, Sita, or rather Sita tells Rama, can you give me that ring? And uh, Rama realizes that that ring he had given to Hanuman. Hanuman had asked to keep it. He said he wanted to keep mm-hmm. it. So a little bit of uh, conversation back and forth happens. And um, then Rama says, Hanuman, that ring appears to be with Brahma. So Brahma had come to me after the Pattabhishekam ceremony, after I was crowned king, and he asked if he can have that ring. And he has kept it there because he said he wants to worship it in Satyaloka, which is where Brahma stays. So Hanuman will go and bring that um, ring because Sita has asked for it now. So when Hanuman goes there to Brahma and um, to cut a long story short, when he actually goes to look for the ring, Brahma tells him, look, I have a a small pond in Satyaloka. The ring is, I keep it there at the base of the pond inside the water. So go there and you can find the ring. When Hanuman steps into the water to find the ring, he realizes that he's stepping into a bed, um, which is completely made of multiple rings, which I look identical. So he comes back to Rama and he says, I didn't know which one was the ring. They all looked identical. So Rama smiles and he says, Hanuman, for every time that I take form as Rama on this earth, every time I do that, Brahma takes a ring from me and he keeps them, uh, keeps it in Satyaloka. So this is a reminder for the world about how I constantly emerge. Mine is not just uh, something that emerges once upon a time. It's not a once upon a time mm-hmm. story at all. So I particularly like this story because it just talks about how the idea of Rama can keep see- resurfacing into our lives, whether it is in terms of um, handling distresses in life, whether it is in terms of spiritual evolution, whichever stage it is that we need something, I think the Ramayana can speak to us. That's that's why I particularly like this. And in terms of shloka, I think um, I'd pick one that says, that in many ways summarizes the different stages of spiritual growth, um, where each stage has its uh, its own value, its own um, role to play. When we find this in the Ananda Ramayana, not in the Valmiki Ramayana, when Rama asks Hanuman, uh, saying, um, Hanuman, who are you? Tell me really, who are you? And at that point, Hanuman answers so beautifully. He says, when viewed from the perspective of the body, I'm your dasa. Deha drishtya to dasoham. So this is what you see in iconography as well, that Rama is, uh, Hanuman is always at Rama's feet. Deha drishtya to dasoham. When seen, however, from the perspective of the jiva, then Rama is Paramatma and Hanuman is Jivatma in this particular case. So in this case, Jiva belongs to Paramatma. Jivatma belongs to Paramatma and merges into Paramatma. This is what you see when Rama hugs Hanuman as well. So he says, Deha drishtya to dasoham, when seen from the body, I'm your dasa. When seen from the perspective of, your, of the Jiva, Jiva drishtya tadam shakaha, I am a part of you, an amsha of you. But when seen from the perspective of the Atma, Atma drishtya twamevaham, you and I are the same because the, the Chaitanyam, the consciousness that is in, in you is the same consciousness that is there within me, within, within whatever I am calling me, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So, Atma Drishtya Twame Vaham Itime Nishchita Matihi. This is what, um, this is the conclusion that I have come to. Now, in this sense, I feel this really wraps up the entire idea of what is, what is the spiritual quest about? What is, what can my own personal quest be about? Can it be me identifying in which moments do I need to have Dasa Bhavam? In which moments do I need to identify that I'm just a part of that larger consciousness? And in which moments do I realize that that consciousness is what is driving this body? This is a constantly dynamic shifting equation in my own life. And the Ramayana is a living testimony to how that plays out in our own life. So I felt in many ways that beautifully summarizes it uh, for me personally. There are many in- shlokams that I have in- within the Valmiki Ramayana, but uh, just to, to keep it brief, I think this is one that, that is always close to my heart. Yeah, and, and a perfect summary of 
of different intake thoughts in, yes. into one, one yeah, single yeah, segment. Yeah, absolutely. Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita and Advaita, all three uh, merge very beautifully without, without conflicting um, with each other at all here. Perfect, Vinay. And uh, this has been an extremely insightful conversation. Thanks Likewise. again for taking the time. It, it was lovely. And, and I think where we started from, you said storytelling and in the lore are your passions. And that I think came across in this conversation, how beautifully you weaved in different examples. It, it's been wonderful to have you here. And thanks again for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for such an enthralling conversation. I think um, you also caught on to some very, very nuanced spaces and that just uh, prompted some, some sharing from within. So thank you for having me and thank you for such a lovely conversation.